Hi everybody, welcome back to the journey of my YouTube channel and welcome back to my series on classics and my expectations versus the realities of reading them. I really enjoyed and appreciated hearing from some of you that you like this series, so I hope you continue to like it and if you do, please let me know so that I continue to make more of these videos because I want to make videos that people actually want to see. Today I am talking about Dracula. This is not Dracula because unfortunately I don't have a physical copy of Dracula, but it is kind of a creepy looking book, which it should be because it's Grimm's fairy tales and some of these are absolutely terrifying. It's also a very solid classic book and it's red and it just seemed appropriate as something to actually hold up and interact with while I talk about Dracula. Once again, I was really not sure what to expect going into this book. I had heard that it was actually good or I might not have read it because I, I was always kind of interested in the idea of Count Dracula, but I, I think I either expected it to feel pulpy, where it would be like, you know, thrills and chills and kind of this Victorian sense of very cheap but very scary fiction, or on the other hand I thought it might be kind of dry and moralizing, like vampire bad, humans good. I thought it might be very simplistic in that way. I guess I also thought it might be kind of overly melodramatic because I've seen some of the like really really old adaptations, um, not like a whole adaptation, but I've just seen some clips from the old black and white Dracula movies that seem kind of over the top just a little bit in some ways, so I was not really sure what to expect from the tone here. I was also honestly really expecting to find out that I was totally wrong in my expectations of what vampires would have been written like in the 1800s. I thought that probably our modern pop culture idea of vampires is totally different from the classic idea of vampires. And again, from clips of old adaptations that I'd seen or some other older like TV shows or something that would have an episode that, that mirrored Dracula or, or something, I had this idea that in the plot some people would get stuck in Dracula's castle until they got attacked and turned into vampires. But that was really about all I had to go on. Lorehaven has been doing a, a book quest for this, or they did back in October, and I'll link to Lorehaven because they're great. And they wrote some articles, or at least one article, about Dracula that, that definitely made me a lot more interested in it and made me feel more like, okay, there's probably something here that is actually worth reading. So when I actually started reading it, the first thing that surprised me was that the style felt very literary. It felt like it could have been written by somebody along the lines of Charles Dickens, where it really is, is kind of kind of wordy sometimes, which sounds maybe more negative than it should be, but it's written in this kind of poetic style with very wide vocabulary. There's kind of a long description of a storm, which I feel like every writer ever in the 1800s felt the need to insert a fairly long and poetic description of a storm. And even more surprising, there were some fairly long sections talking about like legal stuff and logistics and medieval history of Eastern Europe, which again, I was just not expecting those kind of very adult and real world and grounded things in a story like Dracula, but it did make me feel like the story was more connected to the real world than I was expecting. So that, that was kind of an interesting thing about it. I mean, the, the first character that we meet, Jonathan Harker, is a solicitor, which means that he works with a whole lot of legal stuff and quite a bit of his work is important to the story. So yeah, one of the first really big vampire stories kind of depended on a guy doing legal stuff. And this might sound backwards for a surprise, but the vampires were actually very much how I had thought of them with the pointy teeth and the sleeping in a coffin and you have to stake them to kill them and garlic keeps them away. Like all of that stuff was very much in place in at least this author's idea of vampires by the 1800s. Um, so I wasn't really expecting that. But beyond that, there were a lot of very specific rules for what vampires could and couldn't do. Like there are a bunch of forms they can take like wolf, um, bat obviously, but I think like spider, there are several different animals that they can appear as. They can also like turn into 
particles in a moonbeam. But a lot of these transformations can only happen at certain times of the day, like very specific hours of the day when they can do this. And also Dracula has to have some soil where saints have been buried for him to survive. So he also needs these like massive barrels of dirt everywhere he goes. Like there are just some in-depth rules about being a vampire that I was not aware of. And I guess a really big piece of vampire lore that was different in this book from what I expected is that I had always kind of thought somebody gets bitten by a vampire and now they are a vampire. But that's actually not at all how it works in this version. In this version, if you get bitten by a vampire, you are not a vampire, but the vampire is going to come back and want to drain more of your blood. And if you die from that, you then become a vampire. I also think just in general, if you've been like corrupted by having a vampire bite you and then you die, then you become a vampire. I wasn't 100% sure on all the intricacies of that because trust me, there are intricacies of that. And then because of that, there were just a lot fewer vampires in the story than I was expecting. I was kind of thinking like dozens of undead people, but that's not really how it works. It's a much smaller number number of vampires, but it's very focused and it's very impactful when somebody does become a vampire because it's not just something that's happening left and right. One thing that really impressed me that I was not entirely expecting was the, the female characters, but especially Mina. I had heard that the female characters in this were pretty good, but Mina especially is just like really smart and really useful and active and in the middle of things and everybody really just acknowledges how helpful and useful she is even though she's mostly working with a group of guys for most of the story she is, is very much a part of it and there are times when she's not a part of it but that is as much by her own choice as by anybody else's and what's also interesting is that within the story of the book Mina is really the one who compiles the book because the way that it's written is in diary entries and newspaper clippings and little notes that people have written and it's supposed to be that Mina, as she figures out that weird stuff is going on, compiles all of these different people's stories and records and she like transcribes them off of phonographs and she puts everything together in chronological order so that it'll tell a story so that they can investigate what is going on with Count Dracula. So the majority of the book, if not the whole thing, is actually supposed to be what Mina passes around to all the characters to read so that they can be up on each other's stories and compile their facts and figure out what's going on. So like the book itself is a weapon to fight Dracula with and that is just super cool. I never seen another book written quite like that. Of course, I'd seen books written as diaries before, but not usually as like a bunch of different people's diaries and records. And it's not usually put together in universe like that. Or there are parts in the story where people go off and read the book Dracula that we have up to this point. So I just thought that that was really fun and interesting and kind of meta, but not in an annoying way. And that kind of leads me to the thing that surprised me most about this book and also kind of my favorite thing about this book, which is just the teamwork that comes into play as these different characters come together to fight against Dracula. Each one of them has a role to play. They all have different talents and abilities. There were a couple characters that like when they were first introduced, I was thinking, is this person really necessary? Like couldn't a few of these people have kind of filled the same role, but then as the story went on, I was like, no, I really like that we have this somewhat bigger team with different people with different strengths and experiences that they all bring to the table. And then they just have these like really fun planning meetings where they're like, okay, you're gonna do this and you're gonna do this. And these people are gonna split up with these people and we're gonna cover this part of London. And it's just really fun to see that camaraderie and teamwork coming into play, especially since all of these people just cared about each other so much. They were willing to give their time and their energy and their money and their literal blood to each other just on a moment's notice without even being asked twice. And they all have, you know, their own personal reasons for, for being a part of this fight. But really, especially by the end of the book, they're all in it for each other and they're not going to let any of them get left behind no matter what happens. 
and I thought that was really encouraging and hopeful given that this is a book that I mean it's honestly pretty creepy and dark a lot of the times there's heavy stuff it's from the 1800s so it's not as scary as it probably could be but there are still some really dark and scary things that happen to people and even for like for Jonathan who gets stuck in Dracula's castle initially he's essentially dealing with what we would probably call PTSD today and just to see everybody rally around him and encourage him and be like keep going and, and don't give up that was really cool and it made me really like the humans and root for the humans whereas I feel like in a lot of newer vampire stories you're kind of supposed to root for the vampire you're maybe supposed to want to be a vampire be on their side just because they're cool but in Dracula the point is definitely not that the vampires are cool like Dracula is an interesting villain but I definitely was rooting for the humans and wanted to be on their side because they were honestly more interesting to me like the good people feel like the interesting people that you want to be around they don't feel like these annoying prudish people who just don't like vampires because they're biased so oddly enough for this book being about vampires and about kind of a lot of dark and scary things i honestly found it a comforting read just because of that sense of companionship and teamwork and all of these people have so much trust that as tolkien would probably put it it was a consolation to read it was this very encouraging story that made me feel like let's let's go fight some evil <laughs> And yes, there are some pretty fun action scenes. There are some stretches of the book with surprisingly little action, but then when the action scenes happen, they really happen and they are really cool and exciting. And yes, even Mina does get to use a gun at one point. Um, there are actually several pretty fun weapons and interesting strategies that you have to use to fight when you're dealing with a vampire. So it, it was just really fun to have the team show up and, and fight the evil like that. If you've read Dracula, what do you think? What were your expectations? How did that compare to the realities? If you haven't read it, did anything that I just said surprise you and make your expectations different? Also let me know what other classics I should talk about in these videos again, and if you want to see those videos when I make them, make sure that you like and subscribe and click the bell for notifications so that you will know when they show up. Until then, thanks for journeying with me. Bye!